Excellency, the British Ambassador, Mr. Ian Lindsay. You have the floor, sir. Tisztelt Minister Úr, tisztelt nagy követi barátaim, hölgyeim és uraim. Nagyon sajnálom, Minister Úr, ha ma nem viselem a skót szoknyamat, de inkább egy tipikus angol pincsrajt ruhát. Thank you very much, Minister, for your very kind words. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be invited here today to talk about Margaret Thatcher's legacy in relation to to Britain. I'll focus, if you like, on three areas. Drawing on what Prime Minister David Cameron and British political leaders said about Lady Thatcher, I'd like to give some sense of what her legacy is. You will appreciate that it is difficult for me, as Her Majesty's ambassador, to give some sort of authorised account or official view of Lady Thatcher. There is no such thing. However, we can identify, I think, agreed elements of her legacy from what important British figures said from very different political backgrounds after she died. I'd also like to make a few comments about her famous Bruges speech of 1988 in light of the current debate in the UK on our EU membership. And finally, I'll say a few things about my own uh, contact, my own experience of Lady Thatcher. When Lady Thatcher died in April 2013, David Cameron led tributes to her in the House of Commons, together with, among others, the then leaders of the Labour and Liberal Democratic parties, addressing the question of what was Margaret Thatcher's political legacy. I do not claim that these are comprehensive, but I do believe they give a flavour of her major and lasting achievements. Margaret Thatcher was our first and thus far only female Prime Minister. She won three elections in a row, serving for a longer continuous period than any other Prime Minister had for more than 150 years. Her achievements were remarkable. In a very different era, she became a female MP, the first female leader of a political party in the UK and then Prime Minister. The context in which she came to power is important. Britain was widely regarded at the end of the 1970s as the sick man of Europe, or as David Cameron observed, we were victims of the British disease. I recall from my own experience, and here I must admit that I was involved in conservative student politics, that there was deep despondency about our future. As David Cameron noted, Margaret Thatcher rejected the notion of inevitable decline. Britain needed to change, and she had clear views about what those changes should be. Her conviction and resolve led to major changes in the politics of the UK and in public policy. As she herself noted in the early 2000s when asked what her greatest legacy was, she replied, Tony Blair and New Labour. We forced our opponents to change their minds. And as Tony Blair himself said shortly after Lady Thatcher died, she was one of the very few leaders who changed not only the political landscape of their own country, but the rest of the world too. Or, as Winston Churchill once put it, there are politicians who make the weather. Margaret Thatcher was undoubtedly one of those. After Labour's election in 1997, the new Labour government did not roll back Margaret Thatcher's industrial relations reforms. Nor did Labour think it made sense that the state should once again own a telephone company, the national airline, or indeed a travel firm. Nor did it, did it reverse the right to buy policy, which enabled millions of people to purchase their public housing and flats. As one critic noted at the time of Margaret Thatcher's death, quite consciously, new Labour sought to differentiate it itself from the Labour Party's recent past a history which she had comprehensively beaten it in three general elections. The pledge in Labour's manifesto in 1997 to enhance the dynamism of the market was undoubtedly shaped by the country that Britain had become after nearly two decades of Conservative rule. As David Cameron noted, Margaret Thatcher believed strongly in British and European values for democracy, for the rule of law, for right over might. She loathed communism and believed in the invincible power of the human spirit to resist and ultimately defeat tyranny. 
He quoted her famous Bruges speech in which she said, we must never forget that east of the Iron Curtain, people who once enjoyed a full share of European culture, freedom and identity have been cut off from their roots. We shall always look on Warsaw, Prague and Budapest as great European cities. And so I think my Prime Minister was right when he said that across the world there are millions of people who owe their freedom in part to Lady Thatcher. For example, in Kuwait, across Eastern and Central Europe, and not least in the Falkland Islands. But what is remarkable, looking back now, is how many of the political arguments of the 1970s, the 1980s, and even the early 1990s are no longer arguments at all. As David Cameron noted, many of the principles that Lady Thatcher fought for are now part of the accepted political landscape of the United Kingdom. And that was acknowledged by both Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg in their own tributes in that debate in the House of Commons. Ed Miliband noted that she defined the politics of a whole generation and influenced the politics of generations to come. He said she was right to understand the sense of aspiration of people across the United Kingdom. She was right to recognize our economy needed to change. She was right to defend the Falklands and bravely reach out to new leadership in the Soviet Union. He concluded by saying, whatever you view, your view of her, Margaret Thatcher was a unique and tiring figure. Today, we also remember a prime minister who defined her age. Nick Clegg echoed the theme of a transformational figure while disagreeing with many of her policies when he said, it is impossible to deny the indelible imprint Margaret Thatcher made both on this nation and the wider world. She was among those very rare leaders who became a towering historical figure, not as written in the history books, but when still in the prime of her political life. Margaret Thatcher created a paradigm, setting the parameters for economic, political, and social debate for decades to come. She drew the lines on the political map that we here are still navigating today. He noted that on Europe, she participated in one of the most profound periods of European integration, and she was herself an important architect of the single market. Let me refer now briefly to her speech in Bruges. Like her former private secretary, Lord Powell, I do not believe that Margaret Thatcher's Bruges speech was anti-European nor anti-EU. She championed the European single market and accepted more qualified majority voting instead of the principle of unanimity because she did not want individual countries to block that market. As she noted in her speech in Bruges, the European community is one manifestation of that European identity. It is not the only one. I have reread her speech over the weekend, written 26 years ago in a very different Europe and a def very different world there are, at least for me, many elements which are as true now as they were then. When she said, for example, that Europe will never prosper as a narrow-minded, inward-looking club. I quote, the European community belongs to all of its members. It must reflect the traditions and aspirations of all of its members. And let me be clear, she continued, Britain does not dream of some cosy, isolated existence on the fringes of the European community our destiny is in Europe as part of the community. Now, I'm conscious that the Minister is leaving now. Uh, let me thank him again for his very kind words about Lady Thatcher and about Hungary's relationship with the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom's future in the European Union. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My Prime Minister and the British Government firmly believe it is still the case, as do our Hungarian friends, as we heard from the Minister, that Britain's future remains in the European Union. That view has also been expressed by every single non-European ally and close partner of the UK which has commented on the referendum and on Britain's future and the membership question in recent weeks. Margaret Thatcher continued, nor is the European Union some sort of institutional device to be constantly modified according to the dictates of some abstract intellectual concept, nor must it be ossified by endless regulation. 
the European community is a practical means by which Europe can ensure the future prosperity and security of its people in a world in which there are many other powerful nations and groups of nations. Europe has to com compete commercially in a world in which success goes to countries which encourage individual initiative and enterprise. And again, that plea for relevance and competitiveness, which she made 28 years ago, is one on which both Britain and Hungary could agree on right now. Margaret Thatcher said her first guiding principle is willing and active cooperation between independent sovereign states as being the best way to build a successful European community. She said, I am the first to say that on many great issues, the countries of Europe should try to speak with a single voice. I want to see us work more closely on the things we can do better together than alone. Europe is stronger when we do so, whether it be in trade, in defense, or in our relations with the rest of the world. Much of what she said in that speech suggests to me that David Cameron and the British government is right when it says that the United Kingdom would be undeniably better off, stronger and safer in the European Union than outside, notwithstanding the changes that have taken place in the world and within the EU over the last 28 years. I've waited 38 years for to be able to use uh, a speech which Margaret Thatcher made again in Belgium, but in 1978. The sinews of foreign policy, which she very kindly signed for me in the early 1980s. She said then in June 1978 to Les Grandes Conférences Catholiques, in the European community we have forged new associations between old enemies which have transformed the nature of European politics. She talked about the need for a resolution to keep our friendships in Europe in good repair. Those comments are as relevant now as they were then 38 years ago. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to make a few personal <coughs> remarks, a few personal memories about Mrs. Thatcher. I remember vividly the election of 1979 and the strong sense on election night that we were about to enter a very different era of politics, an era of significant change. Personally, I welcome that. Roll on four years to 1983. My next recollection reflects the esteem in which she was held by many behind the then Iron Curtain. A good friend of mine in the British Embassy in Warsaw, where I was working in 1982 to 83, was not a Thatcher fan. Quite the contrary, she was a strong Labour Party supporter. She is now my wife. <laughs> You can imagine her shock and surprise then, when on election night in 1983, when it was clear that Mrs. Thatcher had been re-elected Prime Minister, her Polish landlord presented her with a large bouquet of flowers and talked lovingly of the Iron Lady. My own contact with her was largely limited to her tour of Australia in 1988, when Australia celebrated its bicentenary. She visited several cities over the space of a week, a long time to spend in any one country on an overseas trip. I was in charge of her programme, flying ahead of her and moving on to the next destination once she had safely arrived in her current destination. It was not always an easy visit. There were protests against her, for example by IRA supporters in Melbourne. But throughout the visit she showed incredible stamina and good humour and kindness to those around her. As in the UK, she argued with passion in her meetings with Australian leaders, a mix of those sympathetic to her politi politics, as well as those such as then Prime Minister Bob Hawke, who had a very different political perspective. She stuck to her guns, underlining her description of herself as a conviction politician, a woman of principle. And so to her departure from office in 1990, I found it hard to believe when that happened. I was in a conference, a foreign office conference with colleagues, and it very much seemed the end of an era, the unthinkable. And my last recollection is from the country from which I came here, namely the Kingdom of Bahrain, where His Majesty the King and His Royal Highness the Prime Minister 
both had a lot of contact with Margaret Thatcher uh, in the 1980s and 90s. And what stays with me, the comments made by His Royal Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Khalifa, the Prime Minister, who noted that on every single visit to the United Kingdom, whether official or private, there was always a note from Margaret Thatcher welcoming him to London and to the United Kingdom. And I was delighted when William Hague, the then Foreign Secretary, uh, met the Prime Minister of Bahrain three to four years ago and presented her with, I think, two or three books on Margaret Thatcher. I have rarely seen a foreign politician, a foreign dignitary, so happy to receive a gift from an overseas visitor. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, it's been a great honor today to speak here. Um, uh, I'm delighted that uh, we are talking about this great lady. I look forward to hearing what others have got to say about Margaret Thatcher. But once again, many thanks indeed.